live. We are live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. There's no one in right now. We'll give it a How second before we start. There's zero people in. Where do you see that? Right here. Ah. I'll take a couple seconds for people to hop on. Ah. Hello. We're going to get started in just a moment. Wait for a few more people to hop on. Get started probably in a minute. That's exciting. Yeah. A little quick introduction before we do our real introductions. I'm Nate. I'm Julie. Uh, I'm an e-advisor with College Advising Corps. And I'm a director of admission at Franklin and Marshall College. Yeah. And a graduate of Franklin and Marshall College. Well, that was back in the dark ages. A proud, a proud <laughs> diplomat. Hi, Stanley. Thanks for joining. Hi, Stanley. Hi, Jared. <laughs> oh, this is cool. Yeah. This, this is, is my this is my first time doing this. Yeah, this is my first time doing a live stream too. Oh, hi Nate Cody. Yeah. yeah. Nice to meet you too. Okay, right, let's get started for real now. Okay. So, um, this is obviously a college advising core stream. Uh, we support low to moderate income students uh, through the college application process. Uh, feel free to comment anything you want to see in future live streams. That would be great. Um, so we're now going to formally introduce ourselves. Um, just for everyone who's hopping on now as opposed to earlier. Uh, my name is Nate Rosenberg. I'm a second year e-advisor. My pronouns are he, him, his. And before I worked for College Advising Corps, I worked at Canyon College um, as a senior interviewer. Um, and tour guide, and I'm joined tonight by... Hi, I'm Julie Carrick, and I'm the Director of Admission at Franklin and Marshall College. I have been at FNM in that role for, geez, a decade. Yeah, um, and we're here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I'm actually like right next door to where I am, and I my pronouns are she and her. Yeah, this is very convenient. So we're just gonna do a little bit of an agenda walkthrough, just so you kind of know what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we're going to start off with a quick application overview, overview, sorry, just to kind of get things rolling. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you as a student can stand out in the application process. Um, and then we're going to end by talking about college interviews. I just want to say, too, that we're going to try to save most of the questions for the end. We'll definitely leave plenty of time for questions. Um, but you do have like a quick question that you think can be answered in like 30 seconds, a minute or whatever. Feel free to chap it in. And if, um, what if, if we are confusing? Can they ask a question right away? If we yeah, yeah, yeah. If, 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 you have, if you have a quick question, some clarification, definitely type that in. I like to just go with the full. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I also just want to point out, too, we're not going to talk too much about financial aid and essays in this live stream, though we'll kind of mention it a little bit. Um, so if you do have questions about that, um, try to save them to ask your e-advisor or check out, um, we've done two previous live streams on financial aid and essays. But if you have a quick question about financial aid or essays, because we're gonna talk about that a little bit, feel free to chat that in, of course. Um, and then we are just gonna, we're gonna try to end sharply at eight because I know y'all have places to be too and we can both drone on a little bit. Yeah. Is it important to, to just note that what we're talking about is holistic application review and not all colleges do a holistic review, but we're gonna, really concentrate on that. And almost all colleges that are liberal arts colleges and selective colleges use a version of holistic review. And that's what we're going to be discussing. Yeah, I probably should have mentioned you're right. Uh, Franklin and Marshall is a small liberal arts college. Um, so again, take what she says and kind of apply it to um, other similar colleges. Yeah, but if you do have questions about other universities and colleges that don't necessarily fall into a liberal arts um, category or the bigger university. Some of the things will st still hold true that we're talking about. Yeah, tonight. Any, yeah. any selective, highly selective yeah. institution. Yeah. Okay. So let's get started by talking about, um, like giving them a little application overview. Through. Um, so do you want to use Franklin and Marshall's application timeline um, as kind of an example to spell things out? Certainly. And when you apply to colleges, there are many ways that you could do so. Um, Franklin and Marshall doesn't have it, but many colleges have something called a rolling decision, which is you are submitting your application as soon as you have it completed, and then a college will quickly give you a decision. If you are applying to any rolling decision school, you should be submitting your application as early as possible because the admission rate is much higher early on, and as the class fills up, it becomes much more selective. 
Okay, Franklin and Marshall College, we have an early decision. We have two rounds of early decision. And the only reason you should ever apply to an early decision school is if you are absolutely in love with that school. And that's where you can imagine yourself for four years and without any reservations. Because when you apply to a college early decision, it is binding. You're going to sign a, um, it's not a contract, but it's like a contract. And you're going to be signing that. You're going to sign it. You're a parent or guardian is going to sign it and your college, your high school counselors are also going to be signing that. Many colleges have two rounds of early decisions. Um, the first round will have a deadline of either November 1st or November 15th. Those are the most typical dates for an early decision one. Early decision two will have a deadline anywhere from January 1, January 15th. Some schools will have a February 1st deadline. And then there's also regular decision and regular decision deadlines can be anywhere from October 15th all the way through February 1st. I don't there might be a couple with even a February 15th deadline. Um, at FNM, it's a January 15th deadline. And then just to make things really complicated, there's early action. And some schools have what's called a restrictive early action. You can only apply to one school early action. It's you apply early, you find out your decision early, and but it's not binding. You do not have to commit to that school and tell them the universal May 1st deadline, which is when regular decision, when you have to when you say whether or not you want to come to that school. Yeah. And what are some, all? yes, I think so. <laughs> um, and what are some possible outcomes you could get at the different stages? Okay, in an early decision, you are going to get a couple different outcomes. You're going to get an admit, and that's when you celebrate and you're all happy, but you're committed to that school and you've got to go. So hopefully that's good news to you. You may get a defer, which means that they're not ready to make a decision on you. They either want to see more information about your academic performance. They want to see another, maybe another quarter semester of grades, and then they'll make the decision or they're limiting how many students they are actually going to bring in in the early decision. And they will defer you to regular decision and look at you with a regular decision um, pool. So that's one. Um, the other one is it could be deny. And that means they're saying, we don't have a place for you in the class. We encourage you to go find another home. Um, Can you apply to a college regular decision if you're denied if you early are, decision? If you are denied early decision or early action, move on. It's better for you. And this, many schools will not accept another application from you. And then in regular decision, you're going to get an admit. Huh, yay. <laughs> you're going to get a deny. I'm sorry. Or you're going to get a wait list, which means that the class at this point is filled. But after May 1, as they find out how many students are saying yes to the school and they need to fill their class, they may be able to offer you admission. If you are highly interested in a school and you are put on the wait list, it's totally appropriate to reach out to the school. First of all, you need to submit your form to say, yes, I want to stay on the wait list. Please consider me. And then you can contact the school, tell them of your interest in any new academic information that you might have. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, and while we're on the topic of just kind of application deadlines and overview, um, when should the FAFSA and CSS profile be completed? Yeah. So just as important as the application, the admission application is all of the financial aid applications and those the deadlines are really important if you are applying for financial aid please make sure you adhere to all deadlines every college is going to have it posted um, so most schools are going well all schools are going to require the fafsa which is the free free application for federal student uh, one level a what's the a part Aid. 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 Yeah, duh, duh. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a free application. Um, and that's going to give you all of your federal dollars as your federal loans. Um, so those deadlines are, again, going to vary from school to school. But early decision is typically going to be, depending on the school, anywhere from November 1st at FNM, it's a November 15th for early decision one. And then for regular decision, it's typically around the early, the regular decision deadline, maybe a little bit after. Um, many schools that are meet 100% of a student's demonstrated need, like Franklin and Marshall College, are going to also require the CSS profile, which is a college board product. And that one is how you're going to get your institutional aid. And it's a much more generous. And uh, a lot of people refer to the CSS profile as the FAFSA on steroids, <laughs> because they're going to ask you a lot more questions. But that's so that they can meet your full need. And those deadlines, like I said, are extremely important. Some colleges are going to have their own forms, 
um, and you're just going to have to comp complete more forms. And then every school, not every school, many mm -hmm. schools are going to require additional documents, whether it's your tax returns, your W-2 forms. Um, so make sure that you have all of that handy and you read exactly what each college needs, because many colleges will not give you a decision until all of your financial aid documents are in. Yeah. So make sure you're checking the college uh, website of the schools, checking the financial aid page to see what they need. And if you're ever not sure, just contact the financial aid office because they will know what their school needs. Yeah. Okay. And why is it important to check your email through the admissions process? Because you're going to get a lot of really important emails from the schools. You're going to get um, everything from your admission decision may come through your letting you know through your email, any financial aid documents that they need, information that's missing they're going to do, their excitement over you joining. I typically tell students when you probably are getting inundated with emails as a prospective student. Once you've decided which schools you want to apply and once you've applied, you can create a different application, a different email address for all of your applications. And that way it's much easier to handle it. And every time you go into that email account, you're only going to see the schools that you have applied and it's a lot easier to manage. But please open those emails. Please look at them. Some schools, a little insight <laughs> Scoop are going to track whether or not you're opening your emails and it's demonstrating your interest. So open those emails because there might be something really interesting in them. Yeah. And what's another thing you might find out in your email that's really important for the admissions process? The decisions? Didn't I say that? Oh, what else? The, the portals for... Oh, gosh, <laughs> yes. That's very important. So every time you start an application, you're going to get some type of email back from the college that's going to say you've submitted your application, congratulations. And this is the link to get onto your application portal. So you're gonna have a different application portal for every single college that you've applied. And that's where you're gonna get your decision, your financial aid, a lot of schools will put um, social media information on there, just things to follow on the school, each college. So you're gonna to have to start creating different email, different um, uh, passwords for each of those. Uh, accounts that you have and just keep track of everything. Yeah. And last thing about the application kind of timeline overview, um, why is it important to make sure that your grades are kept up even after you apply? Oh, because we can change your mind on you. So when you are admitted to a college, you are admitted to them with the understanding that you will be in good um, good standing, meaning that when we, if we admitted you as this student, you're going to continue to be that student all the way through to graduation. Yeah. And also um, schools will also be sending mid-year transcripts too. So it's yes, mid-year transcript will. and final transcript. Yep, we will. We will be yep. getting those. Yeah. And that the school, the high schools will be sending those. You can double check on your portal to see what information has been received and has not been received. So if we have not received your transcript, if we have not received a, a recommendation or the mid-year transcript or any of that stuff, then you can make sure that you contact your high school to find out what happened to it. Yeah. And if on your portal, it's not showing up that you've submitted something, but you're pretty sure your counselor submitted it, um, always the best practice to reach out to the school directly, give them a phone call because um, maybe something got lost on their end. They just haven't got a chance to file it yet. And um, it takes time. So don't panic if you've submitted something and you're like, well, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I'm so nervous. It does take a couple of days to, to yeah. process. As someone who used to scan things for a college office, I can tell you it does take a little while. Um, <laughs> anything else you want to add about the application review? Yeah, I, I think yeah. any, does anybody have any questions real quick on that? Okay, good. Didn't really give time to oh, okay. type in a question. <laughs> People aren't raising their hands. Um, but yeah, so let's jump out into um, <laughs> advice on how to stand out through the admissions process. Um, you mentioned demonstrated interest. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important? Yeah, many colleges, and they'll be very upfront about it, will let you know if demonstrated interest is part, is something that they consider when, they, um, when they're making their decision. And they'll be very upfront, and you can ask a college. So if you wonder and you can't find it anywhere, it's a totally appropriate to, to reach out to a school and say, is demonstrated interest part of your decision-making process? And guess what? By that email, you've just <laughs> demonstrated your interest. So you can demonstrate interest by going to visit the college, by contacting the colleges. If the college comes to visit, if you're fortunate to have a college come to visit your high school, um, any of those things where you are actually connecting with a college, that's when you're demonstrating your interest. But I just want to say that 
don't look at demonstrated interest as a game that you have to play where you're checking off list of things like, oh, did that, did that, I'm good, I'm good. But look at demonstrated interest in this way, that every time you are demonstrating your interest, in theory, you are actually learning something new about that college and you are now just learning, do I want to apply to that college? Do I want to enroll at that college? So a demonstrated interest is actually empowering you and not all colleges track it. Yeah. Is that um, clear? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Let us uh, let us know if you have any questions about demonstrated interest because it can be a little bit confusing. Um, do you think it's important for students to proofread their applications before yes. submitting? So the best way that you can stand out as an so Franklin and Marshall doesn't really use demonstrated interest. We're going to admit a student whether or not they're ever, ever to, if they are a great student and they've never contacted us because they haven't had the opportunity, we'll still admit that student. They do not have to demonstrate their interest because the absolute best way you can demonstrate your interest at any college is by submitting a good application. And a good application is an application that you have proofread and not just your essay where you spend a lot of time looking at that essay and reviewing it and editing it and making it perfect. But every single letter that you put on that page, every single word, please proofread it from beginning to end and take some time to, to do it before you hit the submit button. Yeah. And it's important also to have another set of eyes look at your college yeah, application. It is. Um, don't trust spell check because guess what? Caption is a correct word but perhaps the word you're looking for is captain. So you are the captain of the low cross team, not the caption of the low cross team. Are you speaking from experience? There, I but. am seeing <laughs> that, yes. Um, yeah, and so I mentioned having another set of eyes to look at your um, your application. Don't forget, you can, on the Common app, you can actually, like there's a add a counselor feature where you can add um, either like a close teacher who's agreed to like look at it for you, or you can also add your e-advisor as a counselor. Yeah, but um, if anybody edits, if you're having anyone look at your application or your essay, please do not let them write on it. Because the minute they write on it and edit it, they're taking your voice away from it. And you want to make sure that that application from beginning to end is your voice. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so on the application, the common application, the coalition app, there's an opportunity to talk about activities. Do you have any, because I know a lot of students, and even I get sometimes confused about like, what's the purpose of the activities? Yeah. What, what would you say about the activities section? Yeah, the activities is an opportunity for you to share a little more about who you are and what you do outside of the classroom. Perhaps you are an athlete and you spend a lot of time on the field or in the on the court or whatever sport you play and you want to share what those roles are. Um, maybe you spend a lot of time in your community doing service, or maybe you have a job and you're working part-time or full-time during the summertime. You are um, taking care of somebody at home, um, a grandparent, a, a younger sibling. Those are all things that are sharing about who you are and what you are doing. It gives us another lens to look at what kind of community member you may be in our community. Because if you're applying to schools um, that are small, selective liberal arts colleges, we're forming communities. And through that activity sheet, we're actually seeing what types of things you might do on our campus or what you're doing later. Um, so we just got a question to the chat about what are some extracurriculars that stand out? Well, extracurriculars that stand out are the ones that are authentic to the students, so who you are. but. What you want to be careful to, in doing that, we're looking at depth and breadth. So if you've spent a lot of time doing a particular activity, like all four years, we're looking at that. Or if you're doing, um, if you've had leadership opportunities that you can stand out that way. Um, you can stand out if you're, so here's something. So some students will put down a club, a high school club. I have no idea what that club is. So an example is, Oh, who's that guy? A lot of people are into it now. I gotta think about it. It's the the artist, um, Roth, Ross. No? I don't know what you're talking okay. about. <laughs> so there's like some high schools have these bizarre clubs by names that I don't know because I'm not in your high school. So if you're in an interesting club, tell me what that club is. Don't assume that the reader knows what that club is and then what your role is in that club. So taking the time to to explain what your role and what that club does. But you stand out by um, by being authentic to who you are. And 
by the breadth and or depth. And if you're a student who hasn't figured out what your passion is, you know what, you're a typical 17 year old and that's really a-okay, you're gonna figure it out later. And maybe you've just done a lot of experiment and you've done a lot of different things that you're trying to figure it out. But don't pad it. That's sort of the opposite of standing out is when you start padding it. It's like, oh, I did an hour here and an hour there. If, you, if you're not spending significant time, don't waste the space of the 10. Yeah, I think you have 10 spaces to put mm -hmm. something on it. Yeah. Um, so another question, um, should we attach a resume to our application when colleges ask, even if most of the information is already on our application? Okay. I would generally say, as an advisor who talks to students, okay. is that if the college asks for something, submit it. If they ask for it, submit it, yeah. because they're looking for a little bit more information and they see how you, how you put things together. Um, if you think that applicant, that additional information is going to supplement your question at it. So here's an example of something that may supplement your, your application. Let's say you are a musician and you play an instrument and you play your instrument well, not like Nate. So you do not want <laughs> You would not want to put a saxophone example on yours, correct? Okay, that's, this, is a, this is a personal attack on me right now. <laughs> so you're going to put, if you play your instrument well, send us a sample of your instrument. If you're an artist and you enjoy art and you are actually pretty good on it, you can submit samples of your artwork. If you're a dancer, you can send us a video of your dance work. But that's all a great way to supplement your application with, um, with things that are who you are and how we get to see you. Yeah. Um, do you have any quick advice on what a good resume includes? One that is um, succinct, that has been proofread, and isn't um, that there is white space on it. Um, I think a lot of times students feel like they have to fill up the entire page with it. Mm -hmm. um, think about visually how it looks, as well as what's actually the words on the page. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, I think that makes sense from also to me a, a resume for a job too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, advice. and don't use funky um, fonts. Yeah, no comic sans. Yeah, no funky fonts. Yeah. <laughs> it's good advice in general. Also for any papers you're submitting. Yeah. Um, would it be best to list only school-related activities in the activities section, or is it best to have a balance between school-related activities and personal activities such as knitting or drawing? It depends on who you are. So if you are a student who spends significant time on school activities, then that's absolutely what you should be doing. If you're a student who spends significant time playing video games, no, I'm just kidding, don't put that on there. <laughs> so you're gonna be putting on things that are who you are. So it can be a balance if that's who you are. But it just, again, I'm gonna repeat, be authentic to who you are and how you spend your time. Yeah. Does that does that answer your, your question, Kang? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so to kind of wrap up the advice on how to stand out, um, we're going to talk briefly about the essay. Um, but again, I'm going to encourage you all to watch the live stream on um, the college essays or to talk to your advisor because we, we also want to make sure we have time to um, talk about oh, interview. Wait, sorry. Okay. I, there's a question here that says, what does a good resume yeah, I have? Some, yeah. I know, but I'm just, I'm thinking, I said what I didn't actually talk about the content okay, of gotcha. it, and, gotcha. and I just want to make sure I answer that question. Mm -hmm. And a good resume is going to have um, your contact information at the top. It's going to have accolades and honors on there. Um, it's going to have a body of what work experience you've had and a body of what community service you've had and then any special talent. So it's going to kind of look at it in different sections um, for some students when it there's going to be a balance. Some are going to be much larger than others. Um, I've seen resumes that spend more time on the academics because that's where the student spends time. And I've seen others where their work experience or their um, their leadership opportunities are the, the high the highest. Yeah. And I know um, in like our some of the e-advising databases, whatnot, we have some um, resume advice and like oh, tools. Good. Um, so definitely reach out to your e-advisor and see if they can find some of those resources for you because yeah. um, we definitely have those. But if you don't have a resume, which is is fine, don't feel like you have to submit one in the application because it, the application by the pieces that we're asking in the Common App or the Coalition, all of those points are going to be answered. But again, if a college is requiring something, make sure you do include right. that because if, right. they, if they require it, they need it. Yeah. And a lot of times they're going to say optional but recommended. And that's when you should submit it, thanks as well. Same for essays. Correct. And moving on to the essays. Yeah. Um, what do you think your number one advice is for essays? 
being authentic to who you are. You only have 650 words to share an introduction to the college about who you are. How do you want to think about it as a handshake? And the first thing that you're going to say, how do you want to be introduced to that college? And then how, what do you want it to say about yourself? And it's got to be your voice. Um, and you're going to get a lot of advice on what you should write on. And this is the part that I think stresses students the most. Um, and I think it's the stresses the students the most because you maybe put too much weight on it. Um, and it's just one portion of an application. And I'm going to tell all of you that we have admitted students who've submitted not so good essays, and we've denied students who've written fabulous essays, because it really is a compilation of everything that you're submitting. So take a little pressure off yourself, write a couple different versions of essays that are authentic to who you are, and then select the one that sounds the, sounds the most like you. And then visualize this, you write an application or you write your essay and you don't have your name on it and then you drop it in a busy hallway of school and your best friend or a very close friend is right behind you and they pick up that essay, if they can identify and like, oh my gosh, I know who that is, that's Nate, then Nate nailed it because he has just given his voice to the, to the, to the colleges that he's applying. Yeah, good advice. That's why I tell my students to be genuine. Yep. Um, so let's jump into college interviews, my favorite topic. Oh, I like them too. What's good? That makes sense because we both have to, we used to, I, mean, I used to have to interview students. Um, I've done, done a lot of you, You're an expert too. Um, so to start off, I'm going to briefly talk about the different types of interviews that schools may offer. Um, and just be aware that not all schools do offer interviews. Um, and we'll chat a little bit about what to do in uh, those cases. Um, so one main way that students, uh, that's, excuse me, that colleges and universities do interviews is virtually. Um, so whether that's Skype, a phone call, Google Hangout, FaceTime. Oh, like um, we're doing right now. I, could, I don't think there'd be a, be a live stream like this, a multi group interview. Um, but yes, basically that is correct. Except we can't see them. They can only see us. That, that is true. It's a one, a one way interview. It's like a one way mirror. That's kind of boring. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so the college will tell you what they do. And usually you sign up um, for one of these interviews uh, by uh, the college will have the information on their website. You might email, you might call into the office um, to set one of those up. And it may be with a student, maybe with a um, director, dean, admissions counselor, um, depends on the college. Um, there's also an alumni interview. Um, this is a great option for um, students who can't necessarily travel to a different state or a different city to actually go to the college to interview. And some colleges only offer alumni interviews. Right. Okay. I didn't know you yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so usually it's, it, I mean, it is going to be an alumni. Usually it is going to be an alum. Um, and they'll chat with you um, and they'll like report back to the. Some um, places use parents, current parents, oh. as alumni interviews. I did not know that. Yeah. That's new to me. So alumni and parents will lump those together. Um, and usually that can be at like a coffee shop or something. Sometimes um, sometimes it's like, in like a hotel lobby. Sometimes if it's like a big organizational type thing where they're bringing a lot of alumni to interview students at the it's same time. usually in public spaces. Right, it's usually in public spaces. It's never going to be at someone's home or anything. Right, and if you are uncomfortable about a space where you've been offered the interview, you do not need to go there. You can suggest a different place. And if they've offered it in some place that makes you uncomfortable, you should absolutely let the college know, and they will not look badly upon you, but they need to know that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, and then the third type is professional staff. That's an example of professional staff right there. Um, and um, so that's going to be a director, a dean, a counselor, um, whatever. Um, and they'll just have a chat with you in their office. Um, during, or regionally. Or regionally. I was about to get to that. Oh, sorry. In, in their office, um, at the admissions office, or um, when directors, deans, counselors, or whatever are on their travels. Um, they will have interviews as well. Um, to sign up for those, um, you may actually get an email from the college, be like, we're in your area, sign up for an event. That's why you read your emails. That's why you read your emails, <laughs> exactly. Um, but then also, if you haven't gotten an email, and because maybe like you live like an hour away from the city or something, but it's easier to get to the city than it is like across the country or whatever, um, you can check out the website, the admissions website. Sometimes they will have um, like a list of where all their directors and deans are going. 
Um, and you can try to sign up for one that way. Or again, as I've kind of mentioned several times, if you're not sure, call the office, see if like, will anyone from uh, your college be in my area? Because even if it's not for an interview, you might get a chance to just meet the like uh, someone from the staff and that's always a good option. Um, and the last kind of main type is the near peer model. Um, so that would either be like a current student, usually a senior, um, maybe like a fellow who has just been out for like a year maybe. Um, and so you're just, you're talking to someone who's pretty close to your own age. They're in the college process. Um, as someone who used to be a college interviewer while I was in college, that's my favorite model because I think it's really cool to kind of chat to a peer. Um, they can kind of give you the 411. They can spill the tea on what... Um, on what, I don't uh, even know what that means. <laughs> on kind of what the situation is in the college. I professionally um, like the professional staff. That would be my favorite. I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. Um, and so I, that kind of leads us then into talking about why it's important to interview if you're able to. Um, because what kind of like what I just said, it's a good chance for you to kind of interview the college. You can kind of find out what the situation is in the college. What's the vibe of the college? Like, will I be a good fit there? Um, but you want to talk a little bit about why you yeah. think it's important to interview? I think if you're able to. Interviews that are tend tend to fall in three different categories. One is they are evaluative. Um, so colleges that are really using the uh, the interview as a as a like an interview, like for a job, they're they're seeing if that you are if they're going to admit you. They're going to use all of that information in the admission process. Schools that ha are evaluative tend to highly recommend or require the application. And some schools, if you are applying for merit scholarship, require an interview. So just keep it in mind. So you want to be looking at all of that kind of things. So evaluative is one. One of them is where it's just informative, where you're learning information about the school. You're getting the 411. What was it? The tea? Spill the tea. You're spilling the tea on them. So that's your finding information about the school. Um, and then some schools are going to be a combination of the both where you're having a conversation back and forth because they're sharing information and you're finding out more about it. But they're also in the process learning things about you. So it's evaluative and informative. If a school, um, so schools will either require um, interviews, they will recommend interviews, they will offer interviews, or they will not offer them at all. So there's a lot of different degrees, and you can find all of that on a college's website. If they don't offer an inter, if they don't offer interviews, you can't push to get one. Um, they just, they either they receive way too many requests, they don't have enough folks to be able to do the interviews. Um, but if they do not offer them, then that's not something that you should push for. I will say though, um, it's not necessarily pushing, but if you are interested in interviewing to find out more about the college, you're always free to call like, hey, can I chat to a student to kind of get that, that current perspective? I think that's something we can do. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If you're visiting school, you can. Oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. Take every advantage of like talk to a student or talk to a counselor and just, it won't be an interview, but it is a chance for you to kind of chat about the college oh, a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so a question, and I think this is a great one, as someone who um, doesn't always have the best memory in an interview. So oftentimes you're going to see your interviewer writing information down. And that information could be either something witty that you said and they want to remember or something remarkable that you said or just something to help when they go back to to sort of review your um, your interview just to help them jog their memory. Um, so they may use a couple adjectives to describe the student. They may think of, they may jot down things, just topics that you discuss without the details of what you've discussed. But it's really mostly, if you see them writing, don't be nervous. They're just helping to jog their own memory so that they can remember that conversation very well. And just for the to be fair here, I've been in many interviews where the students are writing mm -hmm. down as well. So sometimes it's kind of cool to come into an interview with a set um, list of questions that you want to ask and just your own notebook that you can start writing writing down things. And appropriate wear, what should you wear to an interview? This is a great question. Actually, that's kind of depend. Yeah, and I think that you should be comfortable in your interview. So, but you also want to look nice. So, how what kind of clothing would you wear? Something that you would wear to on a nice day of school, but you don't have to wear a suit. You don't have to wear a suit and tie. You don't have to get all dressed up. And I think that folks who wear um, 
too many distractions on their wrist, whether it's, it's interesting, like bangles, the things that make noise. So every time you put your hands on your desk, you make a noise on it. You want as few distractions um, that you, if you're a fiddler that you're going to be fiddling with, mm -hmm. uh, but you want to look, you want to look nice and presentable, but you don't have to get totally dressed up. What you should not wear to an interview is another college's sweatshirt. Yeah, kind of a foot pop. <laughs> and I will say too, as an interviewer as a student worker in the office, I would tend to wear jeans and like a nice sweater. Yeah, so but I, like it or not, and I'm just going to put this out there, fair or unfair, we all, we all make um, first impressions can go a long way. And we all make initial judgments based on our first impression of a student. And I think it's totally unfair. But so what you wear, what do you want that, what do you want that impression to be? And then I go back to being authentic. If that's who you are, then that's who you are. Yeah. Um, so let's. That, did I answer your question, Nathan? I hope so. I hope it did too, <laughs> Nathan. Um, so let's talk briefly about um, colleges that don't interview and why, what you can kind of do, or stand or if you, or you can't interview at a college because there's definitely a lot of ways you can stand yeah, out. Almost every college has what would be called a regional representative for your area. That's somebody that you can contact to find to start a dialogue to ask questions. You don't want to ask them questions that can easily be found on a website, nor do you want to ask them questions that they have to do lots of research to answer. That's not a great way to start that that relationship. And you don't want to be emailing them every day and every second. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, spreading it out and appropriately asking questions is a great way for you to make yourself known to that college so that when uh, the best way to sort of describe this is students who I have been in contact with during the during the year, when that application comes across my desk, I remember them their name and I, I stop for a second. It's so like, Oh, yeah, I remember Nathan. Mm -hmm. I remember this student because we had this conversation and it just pauses enough that I, I start putting it all together. Yeah. Um, and I think there's other ways to kind of like stand out and really show who you are. I think supplemental essays are a great, great way to do that. Yeah. And if a, st if a college has an optional supplemental question, think of that optional as required because it's a way for you to stand out to answer it and a lot of schools their optional essay is going to be why whatever the college is and again think about it responding to that question in the way that how will I fit on your campus and how can I imagine myself on your campus yeah oh, that's a good question and uh, uh, Julie has a little bit of experience with posse too so you might be able to answer this what? Um, what type of questions should you be prepared for in top academic scholarship interviews? Do you think it's different than the questions you get in college uh, interviews? Um, yeah, oftentimes they're, they're going to be digging in a little bit deeper on your intellectual curiosity um, to try to find out a little bit more about what makes you excited when you're in the classroom, what makes you excited about learning. We're looking for students who are going to be engaged, lifelong learners, and if it's a academic scholarship interview, they're really going to try to get to the depth of your intellectual curiosity. So um, kind of come prepared with um, information about why your class, why a particular class is your favorite class, what type of teaching style you, you thrive in, how do you learn best, um, how, do you, how do you study, how do you um, engage others in the learning process. Come prepared to answer questions or to talk about subjects like that. Yeah. And, and another one that, that you might should be prepared for is a question that's going to ask about um, how you overcome challenges and how you overcome difficulty. So if you can have particular instances where you've been challenged in the classroom or outside of the classroom and how you succeeded in that or overcame that um, and think of concrete examples, um, that, that's always a good thing too. Yeah. And as far as questions that you should be asking the interviewer, um, I think questions that like you can't find on the website, um, questions, yeah, or, questions, the questions kind of about, like, I think a great question to ask is like, why did you choose a school if you're talking to a, a near peer uh, or an alumni, if you're talking to a staff member, like what, like what, like, what attracts you working here? Yeah, questions and, that like, just like are a little bit more personal, but not like overtly personal. Yeah, of. and asking questions like throughout. So just as, right. you, as you're thinking about it. Um, as a conversation. Yeah, so as somebody says something, you may want them to elaborate or you want to find out a little bit of information about them. 
But every interview is going to end with, do you have any questions? And the they answer may, is yes. Yes, they <laughs> may very well have asked, asked, answered every question you've sort of built in to, to answer, but come with sort of a couple extras because we are, that again says, I was paying attention to everything you say. I'm very interested in you and I want to show my intellectual curiosity. So I do have a question. Yeah. But you're not going to say all that other stuff first. You're just going to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, don't need to qualify. Um, just to kind of wrap up the um, talking about other ways to show interest and just kind of to show off who you are. Um, the letters of recommendation that your counselor and teacher write. Um, that's kind of a way to show off who you are. So think about who you ask to. Yeah. At this point, most of you have probably um, already asked somebody to write your recommendation. But if you have any sort of lingering ones that you haven't asked the person yet, think about what teacher knows you sort of best and can speak about your, what I just said, your intellectual curiosity, your kindness. Um, I think that's an important thing. Your qualities as a team player, a person who helps other students as well. Um, don't necessarily just use the teacher who gave you an A. Yeah, I agree. Um, so we're going to wrap up talking about interviews. I'm going to make sure we leave time for kind of general Sorry. questions at the end. I no, we're, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about some advice um, for your interview. Um, and again, like this is something talk to your e advisor about. Um, we offer mock interviews to yes. our students um, nice. most of the time. So definitely ask your um, advisor if that's something they'd be willing to do. Um, if not, I'm, I sometimes help my other advisors with mock interviews. But yeah, that's tangent. Um, but so I think my personal, my favorite advice is um, to be yourself, but be professional. So definitely don't be what you think the college wants you to be. So don't try to put on a persona that you think the college wants to see. Be who you are. Like, what are your passions? That's what I'm, that's what I was interested in. I was like, my favorite interviews are the ones that I would walk away coming out like, wow, I want to do more like research on my own time of this really cool thing this dude mentioned. That's really awesome. They're so passionate about this. And you could really tell when it's doing was being genuine. And that was always really neat to see. And I'm going to go back to say, if you don't have a passion mm -hmm. yet, that's you're fine. 17. That's okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we spend too much time in the college application talking about, you know, understanding the student's passion and getting about it. And as a student who, well, it's been a long time <laughs> since I was 17 years old, but just watching so many people go through this, that it's, Take pressure off yourself if you really haven't figured that out. Yeah, so yet. don't don't create yeah. a passion you don't have. Yeah. Um, if you were, and then you just like, so to be genuine, like, what's your favorite book to read? Like, answer that, like, very truthfully. Like, don't say, like, oh, my favorite book is, like, The Great Gatsby, but it's not. Like, if it's, your favorite book is Harry Potter, like, I would rather talk with you about Harry Potter for 10 minutes rather than talk about a book that you don't actually care about. Um we have a quick question. We'll stop to take to, a um, couple of questions, actually, which is great. Yeah. Um, how do you suggest a student with severe social anxiety approach schools that require or recommend interviews? That's a great question, Shelby. Yeah, and I think that um, we have interviewed students across the spectrum. The gregarious student who loves to be like surrounded by people all the time, and the students who who are anxious, and the students who are incredibly introverted and the idea I would I could tell you I was very introverted I mean still I'm pretty introverted but during the college process yeah. I was pretty introverted and I guess what I want to tell you about that is that um, when you go into a college interview we're looking for reasons to admit you not reasons to mm -hmm. reject you we're looking for reasons to to find a commonality with you uh, an, an interest with you um, and the vast majority of people who are interviewing are kind people who just love people and love, love hearing stories, students. talking to people. So yeah. I know it's easy for me to say, don't be nervous, but really don't be nervous. If you can think about an interview as a conversation and nothing more, it's like, oh, I'm going to go speak with this, this person. And it's just a conversation. It's not an interview. If you can no. try to put that in your mindset, I think that that, that may help you a little bit. Um, and then remember to breathe. Um, important. Bring, bring a bottle of water with you. Yeah. That's also a great way to kind of, if you're, if you're rambling, if you're not sure, like take a sip of water, like hide yeah. your discomfort. That's a pretty good tip too. And just stop and breathe. Yeah. And smile. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I will say too, 
something I would never make like, a, I know a lot of students are kind of concerned about like eye contact and whatnot. Like I would never write in one of my like write ups afterwards, like so-and-so didn't make eye contact with me. Like that's not something I care about. I care more about the student, um, that they enjoyed the conversation that we were chatting. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I just, I wouldn't get too worried about 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 that either. Or something yeah. like that. And Hannah asked a great question about: Is there anything that we've seen so far, like in an application or an interview, that maybe we stop for a second, like, "Ooh, I want more students like that," so that that maybe. You... And I can't answer that question because the students that stand out, the students that I want more, are what Nate just said. They're the students who are authentic to who they are. So it's this wide variety of students. But what stands out about them is they are true to themselves and you can tell that they're just naturally comfortable in their skin and they're naturally kind of just excited to be sharing whatever it is that they're sharing. And no, 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 no. Oh, and they're also, they're showing that they're genuinely interested in the college. Like, yeah, I, 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 love, I, I love students right. who just, they walk in and, and they're asking questions. And, and all they talk about is F&M and they're just so excited about F&M and all they want is F&M. That does kind of stand yeah. out. I, on the flip side, I will say it's a little bit of a humorous aside. But I, in one of my interviews, um, I asked a student, so why Kenyon? What, or what brought you to Kenyon? And the student answered with a different college. Because either they were, I mean, I'm sure they were just tired. Like, I mean, mistakes happen. But it was still kind of like, oh, like, yeah, do you know where you are right now? You don't want to stand out that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a uh, great question, Anna. Yeah, that was a good question. Um, I think another some more important advice is to be prompt. Um, oh yes. I will no, say be early. Oh yeah, be, be, yeah, be, be, early. Be, be early. Yes, I will say nothing is more frustrating to an interviewer than they show up on time, they're ready to go, and either the student just does not show up and never um, lets the college know that right, they're not if coming. You're, if you're sick, can, can oh yeah, please. Like, I don't want to. Not, we don't want to get sick. Right. Um, but definitely let the college know in advance as much as you can. But you should come early because there's probably a little bit of paperwork that you have to fill. Yeah. I give you a moment if you're nervous to stop to go get a cup of coffee, tea, don't don't yeah. get any more caffeine yeah. or water or something and just to, to, yeah. to sit and breathe for a minute. Yeah. And if you are running late, like just let the college know that like you ran into traffic. I mean, traffic happens. I ran into traffic today when I was driving. Just reach out to the college. Say, hey, I'm running five minutes late or whatever. Yeah. And Larissa asked, how early should you be? I say a rule of thumb is you should be there about 15 minutes early. And the benefit of coming early, aside from sitting down and breathing, is most colleges are going to have, they're going to be current students in the lobby, mm -hmm. and you're going to have an opportunity to talk to current students. And if you have someone who's brought you to the interview, a parent or a guardian, aunt, uncle, a friend, um, it gives them an opportunity to connect with those people too. And the more people that you are able to meet outside of the admission office, the better for you because you're getting a better sense of that's the community that you want to be. So mm -hmm. having an opportunity before the interview to chat with current students, I think it helps you relax a little bit and it helps you realize that this is a place where you want to be. Yeah. And I'd say my final piece of advice before we kind of move into general questions, but if you obviously have questions about interviews, keep those coming in. Those will make sure we have time for general questions. Okay. Um, is wow, to, the time went fast. I know, this is fun. Jeez. This is fun. <laughs> time flies, you're having fun. Um, I think is to elaborate. So if a oh interviewer gosh. asks you a question, don't just answer with a yes or no, like no, blah, 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 blah. Yes, blah, blah, blah. Cause you don't necessarily want the interviewer like fishing for more answers. Cause that kind of creates, cause remember we're talking about like having more of a conversation and asking questions. It comes off as kind of like stilted a little bit and it just, it's not really fun for the interviewer or the interviewee. Um, this is a great question that just came in from Rachel. Um, how much research should a student do in the college before the interview? A lot, but not but not too much. Like, <laughs> yeah, you want to leave room for questions, right? But you don't want to do the type of research where like you memorize like every single like, oh, president no. of the college. No, and we're not we're not going to be right. asking you those questions, but a little bit of research. Like, you're not going to ask like how many students are right. at your school or what's the student faculty ratio because you looked that up. The kind of the uh, what I recommend is going to um, you've probably gotten like an intro book from the from the school, so you're looking Even at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of the idea, of, does this have the academic areas of interest I'm interested in? Um, other things that you might, you go to the school, find out what the class profile is, so you find out where you 
maybe fit within that class profile. So, um, for instance, if you are applying to a college and your test scores aren't as strong as you think they'd be, find out does that school go test? Does that school have test optional policies, or do they require testing? Because then you can ask questions around that as well. I think a great tip too is if you're doing an on-campus interview, try to do a tour beforehand. Because that can kind of oh, that can kind of answer some of your yeah. questions, and I also could kind of like jog some questions. Like you're walking around on the tour, and you're like, the tour guide didn't get a chance to ask a tour guide a question that pops in your head, or just because you've been on campus for a little yeah. bit, you've noticed something. Well, for the record, that may not be up. You may not. That may not be possible. But well, you yeah, may course, only yeah. be able to get in a certain slot. And some right, no, colleges yeah. you can sit in on classes, mm -hmm. and some colleges you can have lunch with a student. Um, again, ways to to get to to be at that school a little bit more. And get questions. Yeah. So we left 10 minutes for questions, which is about okay, but we're answering questions throughout, so we're done fine. Okay. Um, so we have some prepared questions that we can kind of talk about if y'all don't have any questions, but we really, if you guys have questions about the admissions process, um, ways to stand out and whatnot, college interviews, definitely let us know. Um, oh, so this student just asked, do I need to know my college major before I apply? Mm, yeah, that is a very good question. And the answer is no. But it also is, it depends. So some schools depend, if you are applying to a school um, for a specific program, you're going to have to know it. But if you're applying to a liberal arts college like Franklin and Marshall, we're not going to pay a whole lot of attention to what you've said is your declared major. Oftentimes, what I, the way I look at it is that half of the students who apply to FNM are undecided. They don't know what they want to major in. And the other half are soon to be undecided, mm -hmm. meaning they're going to change their mind when they get to school. That being said, some schools, like, so for instance, um, I just visited Lehigh today. Um, and while you don't have to declare a major, you do have to choose a college. So you have to choose like between like, engineering and humanity. So you, Got you have to maybe figure that out before. Right, exactly. exactly. But in liberal arts, you can go in completely undecided. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I know a question that I've gotten from some of my students in the past um, is that you have to sign your FERPA rights away for letters of recommendation. Can you talk a little bit about why students should do that? Yeah, because what you can you give a little more context about what just what so that is in general? By signing the by checking the box for the FERPA waiver, you're saying you're telling the teacher or the counselor that I am not I will not look at what you've written about which means by not looking at what they've written about him, you are trusting them to write an honest um, account, an, an honest recommendation about who you are. And we're going to, add, from a college side, we're gonna look at those a lot more honestly and a lot more with more validity than one that has not been checked. Because we're like, oh, well, the student can actually see everything, so how true is this? Does that yeah. answer the question? I believe so. Okay. <laughs> um, I think another important question that a lot of students wonder um, is if you do early decision and it's binding, mm -hmm. but let's say the financial aid package they give you isn't something that you think that your family can yeah, afford. You, or, can, you can appeal. Um, so if you if you receive a financial aid package that is not affordable for your family, even if it's not ED, if it's regular decision, you you should reach out to the financial aid office. You're not looking at it as a negotiation, but you are looking at it as this is not what I can afford. Can we discuss these different circumstances and, and see if we can find a common ground on it. And if you ultimately you are unable to, to do that, you, you will not be held to that early decision agreement. So that's about the only way that you can get out of an early decision agreement is by not being able to afford the institution and the package, the aid package that they had. But before you go early decision to a school, um, I re highly recommend that you go on the school's net price calculator to make sure that that school is affordable and within your family's means. Don't pay attention to, you know, the tuitions and the fees and the, all of that kind of thing at the outset until after you've seen what your financial aid package is. Definitely. Um, and for your question with the net price calculator, I'm sure your advisors have talked to you about that. 
Um, but also, um, if you're not sure what that is, you have just questions about it, definitely reach out to your advisor um, and they can try to help you with that as well. Do you think your students would be curious about how the admission process, like the committee part is? I, I'm interested. Oh, okay. So, um, like how we review an application? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what so let, let's start with the application is delivered at Franklin. Marshall. Okay. And so, your portion of the application is delivered and then all the other pieces start coming in once the application is complete meaning we have all of the the entire application the recommendations the test scores the transcript the application all of that is does that complete. include financial aid um, papers and documents we won't make a decision until but we'll start reading it without it okay. so then we'll start reading what the first thing we'll do is um you'll have one complete Typically, a college will do, you'll have a complete read of the application, and the first reader will take notes on that application, and then they will send that application to a second reader, who will also so take notes on it, and then that application for many schools will then go to a committee where we are discussing the students as a whole and making our selection. So most colleges, at least highly selective colleges and universities, there will be at least two or three or more students. Um, professional staffs who have actually read your application and are familiar with your file. So it's typically not just one set of eyes that are reading an application, which should make a student feel good, but we are reading them very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, so as far as going quickly, can you just give a little bit of context? How many applications do you think you read? In a season. Well, so Franklin and Marshall College we received 9,500 applications this past season, and we had 10, 10, 11 people reading those applications. So you can do the math on yeah. that. I mean, I, I can't actually do the math on that. <laughs> but that's how many but that, applications. Somebody else can read. do the math on that. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is a very important question that just came in from Erica. Um, do recommendation letters have to be from teachers? This is where you're going to read the directions, and it depends on the school. For like, if you're applying to a school like FNM, yes, you're recommend. We need at least one recommendation from an academic teacher, and you can supplement that with um, a coach, uh, a boss, somebody your community service, somebody from your faith, um, a leader from your faith. You can do any of those as a supplemental, but we need at least one academic recommendation. Some schools ask for a peer. A peer recommendation. Some schools ask for a parent or guardian recommendation. Yeah, there's a lot of different varieties of it, and that's where you just need to kind of read what what the requirements are for that particular school. Yeah. I would say if you have one that's more like weird, like a peer or I a student, I think it's weird. Unique, <laughs> a unique recommendation. Like that. Definitely talk to your advisor about that, um, just because I feel like there's not that many resources online. Yeah. Um, if you're concerned about that, it's kind of what you should do. So I think how that's to, like, yep, that's how, right. how to, yeah. um, to, and then also don't forget that you also will need a counselor recommendation too. Yeah. And if you are attending a high school where you do not have a counselor who knows you well, or a counselor who will write you a recommendation, please do not panic because we receive applications from all over the country and all over the world. And having a high school counselor who can write about you is a privilege and not every student has that. Um, so if you don't have that privilege, then don't panic uh, because we read you within the context of your school. So there are high schools out there that it's one counselor for 900 students. There's no way that counselor knows the student well enough to be able to write a recommendation. And we keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, if a student is having trouble being a counselor to write a recommendation, that's right. Is that an instance where they should reach out to the college directly yes. and explain the situation? So, if you're finding that your counselor is not submitting it and it's not coming, then reach out to the to the and the school will waive that. They'll actually just say, "Okay, I, we get it. We understand where you're coming from. We understand the background. Where we will waive that requirement." And you think that's true for most colleges? Mm -hmm. And we won't hold it against you because it's not your fault. Super. <laughs> um, this is, I think, a fun thing to kind of talk about, too, um, kind of just jumping back to the essays. What are some of, just anecdotally, what are some essays that have stood out to you in the past that you've really enjoyed? Yeah, so my all-time favorite essay was written, oh my goodness, a couple years ago, and it was a young lady who was a little fearful of taking new risks, a little, a little bit on the timid side, um, maybe a little anxious is how she would define herself. And so she wrote her essay. She told who she was, and she wrote her essay actually about just going on a roller coaster. 
And that's all it was. So it was, and I was on that roller coaster with her. And as she's going through the tops and the turns and the ups and the downs, I'm learning so much about her, but it's just a roller coaster ride. The best essays that I've read, and this is just my own personal preference, are kind of the the um, the moments and times where you have put me into your life for just those three, five, ten minutes, however long it takes me to write your read your essay. I'm in your life. So I've written incredible essays about the Metro ride from students who are from DC. I read this great essay about this girl who had a backyard garden with her family and she talked about the garden. Mm -hmm. um, essays from student uh, oh a student who wrote a, a shoe essay about the different shoes that she has so it's really about who they are yeah i, I did a little cringe. Sorry, sorry, i did a little <laughs> i did a little cringe at the beginning because i'm scared of heights the roller coaster that's yes. what it scared me i know you're scared of heights oh, yeah. did, was you did you yeah. 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 i didn't like the one about the kitty with bungee drumming yeah <laughs> I, i'm sure you did not enjoy that <laughs> Um, but it was written well, and the it people was. passionate about and it. And it's so just, it was, I yeah. learned who they were. So can you, so this is, I guess, last thing we'll talk about, maybe, because I think this is important, and then maybe we'll have time for one more question from the group that we want to have one. Can you talk a little bit about how you set your own biases aside when you read an essay, and maybe what a student should do if they're worried about a potential bias that, I mean, this is like a big question to throw at the end, but I'm wondering, yeah, well, do, you know, do you know what I'm kind of saying? Yeah, and I think from my perspective, that's one of the reasons that I make sure as the director of admission that every application has at least two sets of eyes. Mm -hmm. Because as much as I set aside my biases, there are biases that are implicit that I can't even that I don't even realize I'm mm -hmm. doing. So I want to make sure that every application has two very different sets of eyes reading that application so that if I if I've got a, you know, a bias against, I don't know, you know, redheads in from Indiana, I don't, but it, let's say that's just my weird bias. That's a very weird bias. <laughs> yeah, that I'm not going, that there would be someone else who does Who doesn't have a bias against redheads And I used to be redheaded, and I lived in Indiana, so maybe that's why the bias came from. Just biased against <laughs> yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's past eight o'clock. So we'll we'll stay on for like another minute. Um, if anyone has any last questions, I hope this was helpful, and I wish you all the best of luck. And just be true to who you are, and and have fun in doing this because in the application process, in its best, is you're learning about yourself and you're finding a place where you can be the best you. Yeah, and don't forget too. I mean, as you have questions throughout the process. Your e advisor is a great resource to ask those questions. It's fabulous. Yeah, it's very <laughs> kind of you. Thank you. Um, and if you have any questions that you kind of want to direct towards, like an admissions officer that you're not sure about, kind of as we talked to, like don't hesitate to reach out to the colleges if you have a yeah. specific question. And you can even reach out to me. I'm Julie Carrick, and I'm at FNM. Yeah. Um, you can reach out with me with any questions, and I'd be happy to help you, even though, even if you're not applying to FNM. Yeah. So ask your e advisor if you have a question for Julie. And yeah. That seems easier. Actually, we can type in. This is the first time we've used the chat this time. Oh. I forgot we could use this feature. Cool. That's the correct email address, right? Yep. Yeah. All good. right. Good luck to all of you. Yes. Have fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. Bye. Now they can't see it.